Hello and most welcome to 1688 of the Heidegger series and I will continue the read of Joachim Schulte's experience and expression And we are now into the memory chapter. And we're looking into the idea that memory could be a sort of an engraving. A depiction of something else, like an experience, a happening, an event. Maybe just a few said words or a nostalgic memory of that particular holiday trip. So it's a bit like Bruno Leschi's Camera Oscura. We are a black box that sort of suck up the environment. Digest it or Via osmosis, it becomes a part of us. And these recordings can somehow be played out and then they will reveal the same thing in some way as the experience. The engraving would be would be possible to like uh, put it on a record player or why not in a computer? And you can.
can rerun it and you can go back to that experience. And that there is an identity there between uh, what you recorded and, so to speak, the actual experience. And we need to, so to speak, regulate these memories inside the head. Put them in an order, beginning with the first. And how do we tell which one was first when it happened in time? Is there some, some sort of clocking device so when the memory gets stored it would be accompanied by a date and place? doesn't fit with the whole situation, I feel, to have memory that way. So when you are living, doing your things, and all of a sudden, in a computer-like manner, you decide to retrieve a memory, unconnected to who, who you are at that moment, where you are, and your intentions in that very moment. seems oddly disconnected.
memory is a certain word in the language <coughs> and it should be used when it's fitting, accurate, decisive. not retrieved at some random moment. I feel more in the way that everything come together at one instant. Your doings, your wants, all the other aspects of the situation, your inclination. They come to er together to create an opportunity for the concept of memory. I will continue now the reading of experience and expression, Wittgenstein's philosophy of psychology. I'm presently at page one hundred and seventeen the last paragraph on that page I think I will read the whole previous paragraph. How do I succeed in keeping memories apart from other types of contents of consciousness? According to the simple model of reading off traces, the answer to this question must assume differences between various psychological faculties which are part of the very structure of the nervous system and potentially detectable. That is, the mind is regarded as somehow able 
to distinguish various contents according to their origins. The mind recognizes that it is dealing nothing. That is the mind, and this is important, is regarded as somehow able to distinguish various contents according to their origins. To illustrate this by means of a simplified Example, sense impressions arrive on track one, feelings on track two, memories on track three, etc. The mind recognizes that it is dealing with memories from the fact that it must first read their traces, whereas impressions, images and other contents of consciousness do not require that. This conception, however, involves two difficulties which deprive it of its possible plausibility. plausibility. First, the 
thirst, it remains completely obscure how the mind could succeed in keeping different kinds of memories apart. We all know the experience of feeling unable to decide whether or not certain images which we have in our minds reproduce something which we have really seen or something which we have merely imagined or seen in a dream. In order to decide such a question, we need more context. And even that does not always suffice. In that event, a question must remain open. The case of the traces would be analogous. That which has been recorded may correspond to a picture. But whether it is a picture of a real occurrence or of a dream or of hallucination cannot be read off from the picture itself. The trace by itself does not suffice to determine the kind of memory. We cannot gather from a written record which lacks all further information 
whether it is about something real or something invented. A conventional drawing of an everyday occurrence does not show whether it reproduces a real event or a dream. But as a matter of fact, we are rarely in doubt about whether what we remember is a real occurrence or a dream. But at, as a matter of fact, we are rarely in doubts whether what we remember is a real occurrence or a dream. Shall we thus need a second kind of track which would divide memories into different categories? Or shall we have to assume that the different kinds of memory are recorded on different tracks? It seems 
that this sort of speculation leads to absurd results. For the more differences we notice, the more devices in the nervous system we shall have to postulate. And these merely postulated devices will surely lack any explanatory power. Secondly, the defender of the envisaged model of memory traces overlooks the fact that present impressions, feelings, etc. themselves tend to in Evolve memories. To see a house involves knowing what a house is. And knowing what a house is implies that one remembers the concept house. that one is able to describe houses which one has seen on previous occasions and many other things.
it simply is not possible to draw a clear dividing line between purely present contents of consciousness and those which include memories of things past. To be sure, one might imagine that in all cases of psychological processes, quite a number of traces are simultaneously activated and contribute to our performances. But under that assumption, the hypothesis of memory traces and the envisaged model lose all their presumed explanatory value. just as a number of traces may be activated without my regarding the results. For example, a judgment about what I am seeing before me as a memory so there is no reason to suppose that in a different case, I call a certain content of consciousness a memory for the reason that I have read it off a certain trace
In the last analysis, the envisaged model of memory traces is misleading because it ignores the creative element in remembering what Wittgenstein used to call memory as a source If I remember a certain passage from the Fourth Symphony by Brahms and hear the sequence of tunes before my mental ear, do I listen to a reproduction of a certain performance If yesterday I heard the fourth conducted by Kleiber and the day before yesterday I heard it conducted by Karayan, then my memory is likely to be influenced by both and it may even be that I am able to reproduce that I am able to call into mind differences between those two performances. But no matter which kinds of traces may be there in my nervous system, I am the one now playing Brahms' Fourth Symphony. It is my present performance, what, I'm, what I am doing now, 
which makes memory such a puzzling thing and at the same time such an important agency But it is precisely because the present performance of remembering is the crucial aspect that the various metaphors of traces in a store can at best articulate part of the puzzle of memory. Emotion in a remarkable passage of his Principles of Psychology. William James writes My theory is that bodily changes follow directly the perception of the exciting fact and that our feeling of the same changes as they occur is the emotion. Common sense says we lose our fortune, we are sorry and weep, we meet a bear, are frightened and run. We are insulted by a rival are angry and strike.
the hypothesis here to be defended says that this order of sequence is incorrect that the one mental state is not immediately induced by the other that the bodily manifestations must first be interposed between and that the more rational statement is that we feel sorry because we cry angry because because we strike afraid because we tremble not that we cry strike or tremble because we are sorry angry or fearful as the case can be Then James comes to what he calls the vital point of his whole theory and mentions what has since come to be called a thought experiment. If we fancy some strong emotion and then try to abstract from our consciousness of it all the feelings of its bodily symptoms we find we have nothing left behind no mind stuff out of which the emotion can be constituted and that a cold 
and neutral state of intellectual perception is all that remains. It is true that, although most people, when asked, say that their introspection verifies this statement, some persist in saying theirs does not. Many cannot be made to understand the question. When you beg them to imagine a way every feeling of laughter and of tendency to laugh from their consciousness of the ludicrous ludicrousness of an object and then to tell you what the feeling of its ludicrousness would be like whether it can be anything more than the perception that the object belongs to the class funny they persist in replying that the thing proposed is a physical impossibility and that they always must laugh if they see a funny object I have to continue with this rather long William James quote after a little break here I must stretch but how true I just have to spontaneously mention but true that to take reactions and bodily movements away what are you left with Thank you very much. Let's see here. I just put to pause. So I continue where I left off. Of course, the task proposed is not the practical one of seeing a ludicrous object and annihilating one's tendency to laugh. It is the purely speculative one of subtracting certain elements of feeling 
from an emotional state supposed to exist in its fullness and saying what the residual elements are What kind of an emotion of fear would be left if the feeling neither of quickened heartbeats nor of shallow breathing, neither of trembling lips nor of weakened limbs neither of goose flesh nor of visceral stirrings were present, it is quite impossible for me to think. Can one fancy the state of rage and picture no ebullition in the chest, no flushing of the face, no dilation of the nostrils? no clenching of the teeth no impulse to vigorous action but in their stead limp muscles calm breathing and a placid face The present writer, for one, certainly cannot
every passion in turn tells the same story. A purely disembodied human emotion is a non-entity. I do not say that it is a contradiction in the nature of things or that pure spirits are necessarily condemned to cold intellectual lives. But I say that for us, emotion dissociated from all bodily feeling is inconceivable. Wittgenstein mentions his theory, this theory and the thought experiment from William James more than once in his later writings on the philosophy of psychology. Our particular interest, however, is an earlier passage from the Brown Book, which was dictated in the academic year 1934 to 35. There, in the context of discussing the question of the correctness of our translations of foreign or radically foreign words. Wittgenstein writes You will find that a justification for calling something an expression of doubt, conviction, etc. Largely, though of course not wholly, 
consist in descriptions of gestures, the play of facial expressions, and even the tone of voice. Remember at this point that the personal experiences of an emotion must in part be strictly localized experiences. For if I frown in anger, I feel the muscular tension of the frown in my forehead and if I weep the sensations around my eyes are obviously part and an important part of what I feel. This is, I think, what William James meant when he said that a man does not cry because he is sad, but that he is sad because he cries. The reason why this point is often not understood is that we think of the utterance of an emotion as though it were some artificial device to let others know what that we have it. Now there is no sharp line between such artificial devices and what one might call the natural expressions of emotion. Compare in this respect weeping, be raising one's voice when one is angry, see writing and an angry letter, d 
ringing the bell for a servant you wish to scold. This passage contains several themes which keep cropping up in Wittgenstein's later philosophy of psychology and interestingly enough even the combination of themes is typical of his later thought. The first point concerns the fact that we justify our ascriptions of psychological states to people by referring to facial expressions, gestures and the tone of voice. This is important not merely because these expressions often are our only grounds for attributing certain states to others. But also because they are often more reliable than what people say. After all, many of these expressions are what we call involuntary ones. They are difficult or impossible to suppress or imitate. And frequently, our attempts at suppressing or imitating them are not successful, 
so that others can perfectly easy and with confidence tell how we feel. The second point is a very involved one. Here Wittgenstein talks about our experiences of emotions and the questions arises in this context are largely colored by the problems already alluded to under the heading of observing one's own state of mind. But Wittgenstein seems to intend something narrower than what is suggested by the word observe. When he speaks of experiencing a certain emotion, he seems to mean that the occurrence of some emotions tends to go with certain typical feelings and that this way of experiencing our emotions is possible only in th if these feelings concern a well-circumscribed part of our bodies. Wittgenstein mentions the frown which is felt in my forehead and the weeping felt in the area around my eyes. But this does not seem to apply to all kinds of emotions. Grief, for example, is not felt in a particular spot in one's body.
certain more specific cir circumstances. On the other hand, are felt in this way. Thus, it may be the case that being very sad, I weep, and this, of course, is closely related to my sadness and at the same time something that I do feel. Tears, however, can also be shed from joy. So the mere fact of crying is not very indicative of the emotion in question. But in the case of joy, at any rate, there normally are other typical feelings in certain parts of our face which tends to correspond to natural and thus reliable expressions of this emotion. The third point mentioned by Wittgenstein again concerns the question of expressing, expressing an emotion. He says that the relation between feeling or expressing experiencing an emotion and a certain place at which it or part of it is felt is often overlooked because we think of the utterance of an emotion as though it were some artificial device to let others know we have it. Now, this connection may not appear altogether obvious. It consists, I suppose, in this 
that the typical localized feeling going with a certain motion is at the same time through the good offices of our gestures, weepings, groans and stammerings related to that which other people perceive as expressions or utterances of that emotion. And Wittgenstein wants to stress that these expressions or utterances are often very natural, not artificial ones. What appears as a way of communicating a certain emotion is not normally primarily intended as such. When I sit at the breakfast table and notice that my father's nose is twitching, his fingers jerking, his brows knit and his face purple, I literally see that he is angry. These unmistakable signs of his anger are not artificial devices he uses to tell me that he is angry. They are his natural even instinctive expressions of anger, anger which, however, do tell me more clearly than words could that he is angry. Of course, he may 
on another occasion. Try to use these signs or symptoms as devices for trying to give me the impression that he is angry. This may work, especially if he manages to feel part of what he is attempting to convey. But it is nevertheless a very different situation. However, the rules of these expressions of our emotions are not always clearly separable. They tend to shade into each other. This is why Wittgenstein asks us to consider four different cases where our expressions are more or less natural as the case may be, more or less artificial. that is artificially employed. To give the impression that one is angry. The third case is that of writing an angry letter. In this case, the medium of writing by itself takes away much of the naturalness of the expression. Writing may come fairly naturally to some people, but even they have to look for the more just and to adjust their grammar and these activities tend to take one's mind off the emotion that originally inspired the letter.
the fourth case in which you are ringing the bell for a servant you wish to scold is a curious one. Here the means used, namely to press a buzzer or to pull a string is decidedly an artificial one, one, but it may still be a natural way of expressing your anger. The servant, however, will not normally be able to tell from the bell sounds whether you are angry or not. As we have seen, one can use what are normally natural expressions of emotion as more or less artificial means of giving the impression that one feels a certain emotion. But our capacity to feign such expressions can also be relied on to the cause oneself really to feel that emotion. This possibility is clearly suggested by James's words and Wittgenstein mentions it in his later remarks on the philosophy of psychology. And how does it come about that, as James says, I have a feeling of joy if I merely make a joyful face, a feeling of sadness if I make a sad one. That therefore 
I can produce these feelings by imitating their expressions. Does that show that muscular sensations are sadness or part of sadness? Wittgenstein's last question concerns the problem of whether there's a conceptual or merely an empirical connection between statements about emotions and statements about the expressions of emotions. If there is such a conceptual connection, then it will be admissible to say that having a certain feelings in your facial muscles is part of sadness. If, on the other hand, there's no such connection that is, if statements about the expressions of emotions only say something about empirical relations between those expressions and the emotions themselves, then it will be incorrect to claim that those muscular sensations are part of sadness. Thus Wittgenstein writes, Suppose someone were to say, raise your arm and you will feel that you are raising your arm. Is that an empirical proposition? And is it one if it is said, make a sad face and you will feel sad. Or was that meant to say Feel that you are making a 
sorrowful face and you will feel sorrow and is that a pleonasm Now, what about the first question? Is race your arm? And you will feel that you are racing your arm. An empirical statement. One thing we must remember is that this statement can be false. This is the case, for instance, when a person we are talking to has taken a drug which renders his limbs numb so that he will feel nothing Another possibility is that he is bombarded with so many exceptionally strong stimuli that the feeling of raising his arm will not register at all. The possible falsity of the statement seems to speak in favour of thinking that it is an empirical one. Emotions are not, and I really like that expression, artificial tokens for something that you are feeling inside. Some sort of signs. Now she is angry, happy, sad. Almost like traffic signs. No, they are deeply interconnected to what the feeling is, what is happening in the body. All those aspects coming together in one simple go. I just can check the time, is it? And there is really no way of discerning one from another. Yes. We have different words, and they are correct to use, use when they are apt, but they, these words like showing sadness, being sad, having sadness in one's heart, 
seem to depict three disjunct levels and trying to take them apart is simply not correct. It is similar to what we said before about thinking you can't look into one's head to see what that person is thinking like the thinking is here only and all the outside is irrelevant, non-connected there is a massive interconnected here interconnectedness here points in double parenthesis to being Zion uh, I think this calls for a great summary but now is not the time I say thank you very much and have a very pleasant morning day afternoon or night wherever you are thank you very much